Well, good afternoon, brethren, sisters, and welcome to our final presentation for today's Zoom meeting. So I pray that you've been blessed by what you've seen and heard. If you joined us this morning, for those who have joined in this afternoon, welcome, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. And pray that this time that we will spend together, <clears throat> about an hour or, or so, uh, will be a blessing as we contemplate on a very important subject, the yoke of Christ versus the yoke of man. Uh, the theme of our series of presentations today was entitled Critical Issues to Test Our Faith. And we dealt with the papal antichrist system of control that is prevailing in the world today and has been revived in recent times under the COVID new normal great reset era that we're in. Also, we dealt with um, wearing out the saints of the most high. That Satan is using the strategy not just of open persecution, but also of creeping compromise. He actually prepares the way for persecution first by bringing in a period of compromise. And then he hits with the, with the persecution to galvanize those who are half-hearted to actually join on his side in order to escape persecution. So Satan is a very clever strategist in the way he operates, and he has fine-tuned his methods as we come to the very end of time. But Jesus, of course, is greater. Satan is a defeated foe. And Christ has already won the victory on the cross. All we need to do is to join with him and fight under his banner of victory, under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel. And for that, brethren and sisters, we need to yoke up with Christ. So this will be the subject matter for this afternoon, and I pray that all of us can gain a blessing, including myself, what it means to wear the yoke of Christ. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this time that we can spend together through this electronic means that we can fellowship across this country. And pray, dear Lord, that we can sit at the feet of Jesus and learn more of him in regards to these tremendous truths that have such an, a bearing upon us for our destiny and our future direction. We humbly pray, dear Lord, that the Holy Spirit will teach us all things in regards to what is truth. And at the same time, our eyes may be anointed with heavenly eyes salve to discern the wily, deceptive practices of the enemy that we may seek to warn others and avoid them ourselves. Help us, Lord, we may continuously seek to wear the yoke of Christ. We may choose to have that yoke put upon our necks. And in so doing, we will indeed find that the burden is light and the yoke is easy. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege that we can yoke up with you. And may we enter in a more closer communion and fellowship with you and with one another as we decide to step upon this very thing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Our opening passage, of course, comes from the well-known familiar text of Scripture, which is found in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, where Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What does it mean, brethren and sisters, to wear the yoke of Christ? <clears throat> Excuse me. We read in the General Conference Bulletin, April the 4th, 1901, that this yoke is one of restraint and obedience. As the animal is yoked, needs to obey the directions of the one who is pulling the strings, so we too must be restrained and obedient under the yoke of Christ. And in that way, we will find rest unto our souls. It's no longer we who are directing our own lives in a wayward, haphazard fashion but it's Christ that's leading and directing us in a certain pathway that leads to life everlasting. Desire of Ages, page 329. By this illustration of wearing this yoke, Christ teaches us that we are called to service as long as life shall last. We are to take upon us his yoke that we may be co-workers with him. The yoke 
that binds to service is the law of God, which we also um, read from the last presentation in James chapter 2, is the royal law of liberty. So embodied within the law of God are the principles that give us freedom, that honors our liberty of conscience and has respect to the dignity of every single human being. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, I find it very interesting. The Apostle Paul uses this term in describing those who were co-workers with him in the spreading of the gospel message. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are written and whose names are in the book of life. Brethren, sisters, male or female, it does not matter. We can all be true yoke fellows as we wear the yoke of Jesus and labor together in the spreading of the gospel. True yoke fellows, may Christ say that of us, as the Apostle Paul said to the laborers of his time. From the Seventh Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1090, letter 144, 1901. In accepting Christ's yoke of restraint and obedience, you will find that it is of the greatest help to you. Wearing this yoke keeps you near the side of Christ and praise the Lord for this. He bears the heaviest part of the load. Notice it doesn't say he bears all of that load. We must cooperate in Christ in bearing our part, but he enables us to bear our part while he carries the heaviest part of the load. What we render to Christ is infinitely small in comparison to what God does for us, but without that cooperation, all that God can do for us will not be done because God does not force his will upon us. He honors our liberty of conscience to make that choice, to either choose to be on his side or to be on the side of the enemy. Review and Herald, October 23rd, 1900. The yoke and the cross are symbols representing the same thing, the giving up of the will to God. We cannot follow Christ without wearing his yoke, without lifting the cross and bearing it after him. If our will, <coughs> excuse me, is not in accord with the divine requirements, we are to deny our inclinations, give up our darling desires, and step in Christ's footsteps. So, brethren and sisters, there's not a follower of Christ who will not wear his yoke, who will not lift up the cross and follow him. All will be co-laborers with Christ, all will be wearing and sharing his yoke. Men frame for their necks yokes that seem light and pleasant to wear, but they prove galling in the extreme. And we will see the contrast between the yoke of Christ and the yoke of man. The Christ's yoke is truly light and his burden is easy. He enables us to carry the cross, but man in wearing his yoke is left on his own to carry that, and it is a galling, heavy yoke. <coughs> Excuse me. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, we know this passage well. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We can manufacture our own yokes and wear them on our necks and go where we please, where we want to, do, to go and do what we want to do. But the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and is given on condition of surrender, of wearing that yoke and taking up that cross. If you want to read a nature of the yokes that are manufactured by human beings, 
I invite you to turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, verses 1 to 6. This whole chapter of Isaiah 58 is a message for this time. And on the question of yokes, it deserves a deeper study. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure and notice exact all your labors. That's the essence of man made yoke. It is a galling, exacting toll on the human being. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Would thou call this a fast, an acceptable day unto the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke, except, of course, the yoke of Christ? In the last presentation, we read in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, and Luke chapter 4, verse 18, that he came to preach deliverance unto the captives. Christ came to bring forth freedom unto those that were bound in sin and in the yokes of man. And this is the fast God wants his people to be engaged in, to break every yoke. The yokes to be broken involve those that inflict heavy burdens, oppression, servitude, and subservience. Special Testimonies Series B, number two, page five. The whole of the 58th chapter of Isaiah is to be regarded as a message for this time to be given over and over again. It is a present truth message. And this issue of yokes is a present truth topic. Matthew chapter 23, verses one to four. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, <coughs> Excuse me, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind what kind of burdens? Heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. I hope you see this being played out under the current regime that we're in today, where the governments will impose all sorts of mandates, but many of them don't follow their own directives. The classic case in the United Kingdom of uh, the Prime Minister and his fellow colleagues parting away whilst their fellow citizens were, for were forbidden to even meet and associate with one another. This is the essence of man made rule one rule for you. One rule for me. I am the exception to these rules that are placed upon the common herd. It's for them to follow these directives, not us. That's the same mindset that exists in every man made organization the privileged few at the top and the oppressed masses at the bottom, the lord in his castle and the serf or the peasant on the farm. During the early Christian church, there was an agitation among some of the Jewish adherents that the Gentiles were supposed to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. But we find the answer given in Acts chapter 15, verse 10, where the council in Jerusalem stated, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? Notice, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. What sort of yoke was it that was so unbearable to the Jewish system at that time? 
Was it the commandments of God? Did the Lord impose such a yoke upon the people that they could not bear it? Or was it the yoke of man-made rules and man-made traditions which added to the word of God and made the service of God a laborious task? The problem with man-made religion is that man manufactures his own rules. He changes them at his whim and he imposes them with a heavy exaction upon all those who are under his rule. And we find in Mark chapter 7, verses 5 to 9 and 13, then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders? not according to the directives of scripture or to the Torah, but the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands. Jesus answered and said unto them, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines what? The commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, he hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things he do. And he said unto them, full well ye reject, notice, the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. Notice, man-made rules were exalted in place of the law of God. It was cast aside in preference to the commandments of men. Mark 7, 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. That was the burden that the disciples says neither we nor our fathers could bear. I found a very interesting number of months back when I was preparing this presentation late last year to read this statement from the Babylonian Talmud. Now, unfortunately, I don't know what volume This statement is found because it is a tome of a work. There's many volumes that comprise the Babylonian Talmud. But in one of the volumes (coughs) in the appendix on page 383, I find these amazing words by the rabbis themselves who admit this thing. The learned reader who is not familiar with the intricate teachings of the Talmud And even the student of the Talmud who has delved into the labyrinths of law for the sake of probing into the ordinances and discussion contained in the volumes. Recording in progress. Will be quite amazed at the seeming unimportance and triviality of the above regulations. The Talmud was the the body of writings by various rabbis down through the centuries from the captivity in Babylon. And it is a tome of a work all containing the words and the sayings and the opinions and the regulations of the rabbis. And when one begins to read this, they'll be amazed. It says that the seeming unimportance and triviality of the above regulations in the same Appendix, page 384, furthermore, at a casual glance, the student will not find in any one of the regulations a motive based even on common sense. But this is the religion of Judaism. It is not based on the five books of the Bible, of the first five books, the books of Moses, but on the Jewish Talmud. That's the difference between the religion of Hebrewism of scripture and the religion of Judaism of man-made rules and regulations. And that was the religion that was prevalent at the time of Christ, which the disciples says neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. Not for political purposes, not for the improvement, moral or material, did our sages seclude themselves in their attic, but merely notice to prohibit matters as trivial and absurd as that of reading by lamplight on the eve of the Sabbath. The Orthodox Jew who is faithful to his religion will not dare even flick on the switch on the Sabbath day because that might involve work in the use of the electric current. 
None of this is based on common sense or on the principles of God's word. It was an exacting religion, prohibiting and adding and multiplying man-made regulations. And Christ came to break that yoke off the people of his time. And it's interesting that when Jesus preached, the masses followed him. The common people especially heard him gladly. Mark 12, 37. Why? And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as having as one having authority and not as the scribes. What did Jesus refer to? It is written. How readest thou the scriptures? That was the, the power of his word. He not only preached the word, but he lived the word. And that's why his word had such an effect and it so disturbed the Jewish leadership at the time. They said it is better for one man to die for the people that the whole nation should perish. They were determined to preserve their own power structure over the populace. Matthew 16, verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then understood they, this is the disciples, how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, of man-made rules and regulations, which do away with the precepts and the teachings and the commandments of God's word. And that wasn't a problem back in ancient times. As we go down through the centuries of time, we find this remarkable parallel as described here in Great Controversy, page 568, 1911 edition, there is a striking similarity between the Church of Rome and the Jewish church at the time of Christ's first advent. So what is the Church of Rome embodied of? The traditions of men. They even say that they elevate the traditions of the church above the word of God. The same problem that existed in the Jewish system at Christ's first coming is seen today in the papacy. And that's why under this mindset and pretext, Daniel 7.25, he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. He thinks to do it because he believes that he is above the word of God. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. Great Controversy, page 58, 1884 edition. Thus the minds of the people were turned away from God to fallible, erring, and cruel men. Nay more to the prince of darkness himself who exercised his power through them. Sin was disguised in the garb of sanctity. When the scriptures are suppressed and man comes to regard himself as supreme, we need only look for fraud, deception, and the basing iniquity. Are we not seeing that today? With the elevation of human laws and traditions was manifest a corruption that ever results from setting aside the law of God. <coughs> and brethren and sisters, Christ couldn't use the Jewish system of his time. He had to start up the early Christian church. The system was beyond reform because he was entrenched in a power cycle for money, wealth, and control over the people. Same book, page 59, the gospel was lost sight of, but the forms of religion were multiplied, and the people were burdened with rigorous exactions. History repeats itself time and time again. Page 87 of the Great Controversy. He, John Wycliffe, saw that Rome had forsaken the biblical parts for human traditions. God couldn't even use the Roman Catholic system. He had to raise up the Protestant Reformation a separate movement that will call people back to the principles of God's word. 
the yoke of Judaism and the yoke of Catholicism is one and the same thing, the yoke of man-made traditions. The Protestant Reformation was the answer to the call of Isaiah chapter 58 verse 6 to break every yoke. And God led out in that Protestant Reformation. And then we see the enemy working behind the scenes through the Counter-Reformation with the establishment of the Jesuit order. We spoke about it in the first presentation to impose total control over the people once again. Total subservience, total obedience was mandated by the papal system. That was to be as complete as the stick was to move in the hand of the person who held it. No resistance, no qualms, no referring to one's conscience, especially to the word of God. It was total enslavement to man. Is there a yoke problem today in our time in which we live? Romans 15 verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now we're going to come closer to home, brethren and sisters, because the yoke problem is prevalent amongst modern Israel. Testimonies to ministers and gospel workers, pages 480 and 481. I write thus fully because I have been shown, who showed her this? That ministers and people are tempted more and more to trust in finite man for wisdom and to make flesh their arm to conference presidents and men in responsible positions. Who are they? Is that the laity? No, that's the leadership. I bear this message. Break the bands and fetters that have been placed upon God's people. Is history repeating itself? To you, the word is spoken. Break every yoke. Unless you cease the work of making man amenable to man, unless you become humble in heart and yourselves learn the way of the Lord as little children, notice the Lord will divorce you from his work. She's speaking to conference presidents and men in responsible positions. That's a very heavy statement. God declares, I will be glorified in my people, but the self-confident management of men has resulted in doing what? Putting God aside and accepting the devisings of men. That's exactly what Jesus said to the Jewish leadership there in Mark chapter 7. Putting aside the commandments of God and the word of God for your own traditions. But she goes further. She said, if you allow this to continue, your faith will soon become extinct. Now you see on the screen there the dodo bird. And there have been many other creatures down through time that have become extinct. But you can still find them somewhere. Is that what extinct means? There's some, some still left around? An extinct faith, brethren, sisters, is gone. And gone forever. And that's why we should pray for our leaders. Leaders in the church and leaders in the world that God will save them, that they will come to their senses in realizing that in exercising that degree of power, which God has not assigned for them to exercise, they are jeopardizing their own personal salvation. And here's the warning given to the Seventh Adventist leadership that if they continue to impose yokes on the people that are not biblically mandated, that are man-made traditions, man-made policy, their own faith will soon become extinct. It is a very sobering statement, and this is a very serious topic that we're dealing with. In describing the conditions under which the physicians were working at the old Battle Creek Sanitarium, it was more than just a problem of pantheism, big as that was. 
Part of the alpha for Parsley at that time was the control exerted by Dr. Kellogg upon his subordinates. We read in Special Testimonies Series B, number two, for years our physicians have been trained to think, they've been trained to think that they must not give expression to sentiments that differ from their chief. Oh, that they had broken this yoke. Oh, that they had called sin by its right name. Then they would not be regarded as men who, though bearing weighty responsibilities, have failed of speaking the truth in reproof of that which had been in disobedience to God's word. What Kellogg imposed upon his subordinates was the yoke of silence. And the same thing is happening today. God calls upon those who have been wearing a yoke of human manufacture to break this yoke and no longer be the bond servants of men. She goes further. Our physicians have lost a great deal out of their lives because they have seen wrong transactions and heard wrong words spoken and seen wrong principles followed and have not spoken in reproof. Why? For fear that they would be repulsed. I call upon those who have been wearing these. Sorry, I call upon those. I have a part of the wording here that's blocked here. I, I call upon those who have been under these binding influences to break the yoke to which they have long submitted and stand as free men in Christ. Nothing but a determined effort will break the spell that is upon them. And that's partly the reason why the Battle Creek Sanitarium burned to the ground. In 1902, it was to break the spell that had been cast upon the entire institution from Kellogg on down, that of silence, that of conformity to practices that were not in harmony with the will of God. The same book, uh, Special Testimonies, Series B, number two, page 45. Those who would be saved from the wily, deceptive influences of the foe must now break every yoke and take their position for Christ and for truth. As we said in the first presentation, with the health work that's been done by the denomination, its facilities are second to none. Some of the world's best facilities can be found in Loma Linda and the Sydney Adventist Hospital. I mean, no expense has been spared like that of the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Absolutely first class, but it was not according to God's blueprint. This was not the way the healing practices were to be carried on by our people. We were to be medical missionaries meeting the people where they are on the ground in their homes and convey to them not only the health message, but also the gospel message of salvation. Anytime institutions and large institutions are established, there is the greater danger of propensity for misuse, mismanagement, and control of the people in those institutions. Centralization, brethren and sisters, is never part of God's plan in his work. Same book, pages 45, 46. The Lord calls upon those who claim to be medical missionaries to free themselves from the control of any human mind. He says, break every yoke. My servants are not to be under the jurisdiction of any man. Their minds belong to me. Matthew chapter 23, verse 8. For one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. But people say, what about church organization? Isn't God's work organized? Absolutely. Is organization important? Absolutely. But what type of organization? On what principles will it operate? These are the questions that are equally important. And James White, who is the architect of the original organizational structure that was established in 1863, mind you, 19 years almost after the Advent movement was born in 1844, which goes to sh show that the church is not synonymous 
with a conference structure system. The organization is to serve the church in the work of spreading the gospel. It is not meant to control the church. But this is what James White wrote about organization. In 1881, seven months before he passed away, organization was designed to secure unity of action and as a protection from imposture. It was never intended as a scourge to compel obedience, but rather for the protection of the people of God. Man-made organizations can be misused if operated under different principles. Christ does not drive his people, he calls them. John 14, 15, if any, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Human creeds cannot produce unity. Church force cannot press the church into one body. Isn't that true today, brethren and sisters? We have the 28 fundamentals. That is not producing unity within the ranks of Adventism. Church pressure from the top is not bringing the people together, but is fragmenting and scattering them abroad. It is having the reverse effect, brethren and sisters, because God is not in this sort of operation. And then notice the punchline from James White himself. <clears throat> The minister who throws himself on any conference committee for direction takes himself out of the hands of Christ. That is so powerful. I'll read it again. The minister who throws himself on any conference committee for direction takes himself out of the hands of Christ. You can say that that minister sadly, is not wearing the yoke of Jesus. He's wearing the yoke of man. And he's been paid by that system to do what he is told. But the minister is first and foremost an ambassador for Christ. And the minister is to preach and to go where Christ, his master, leads and directs. And that committee that takes into its own hands the work of directing the ambassadors for Christ takes a fearful responsibility, James White wrote. One is your master or leader, his comments there in brackets, even Christ and all ye are brethren. That's how serious he took this issue of wearing the yoke of Christ. May God preserve to us our organization and form of church discipline in its original simplicity and efficiency. Well, brethren and sisters, we've moved well away from that model. It was already under challenge at that time when James White wrote these words and published in the Review and Hill, January the 4th, 1881. It gotten so bad that Sister White was compelled to write these words. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 150. The arms of power in Battle Creek are being extended more and more widely. Notice, seeking to control the work far and near and to crush that which they cannot control. She says that is the spirit of Rome in the track of Romanism. Rule or ruin. We read about this in the first session. I lift my voice in protest, she said. The spirit that now controls is not the spirit of the Lord. In the publishing ministry, the book, pages 145, 146, the kingly power formally exhibited in the general conference at Battle Creek is not to be perpetuated. At the Battle Creek Dime Tabernacle, which was the venue of the 1901 and 1903 General Conference sessions, amongst others, but these two were the most notable that were held in that grand building that catered for 3,000 people. Ellen White made a clarion call at the 1901 General Conference. What we want now is a reorganization. We want to begin at the foundation and to build upon a different principle. It was to go back to the model of 1863, all ye are brethren. But tragically, it didn't last long. 
the heart and soul was not in this call for reorganization. For by 1903, she said these words, the results of the last general conference, 1901, has been the greatest, the most terrible sorrow of my life. She was so happy when that call was made and it was accepted by voice, by acclamation at the meeting. But in reality, the changes were not forthcoming. They were not heartfelt and they didn't continue. No change, she said, was made. And mind you, she wrote these words in describing this as the greatest, most terrible sorrow of her life, far exceeding that of the disappointment she experienced in 1888 at the general conference session there when the righteousness by faith message was largely rejected by the delegates. She said a mob spirit took over that conference, that the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram was being repeated at that session. And yet, by 1901, 1903, things had not gotten better. They'd only gotten worse. And so what God could not accomplish through warnings, counsels, and entreaties, he certainly made known through judgments. <coughs> so the sanitarium burnt to the ground, and the Revere and Herald publishing house burnt to the ground, and the Haskell home for orphan children burnt to the ground, in Battle Creek, February 1905, with the loss of three little children. And then the diadem, the jewel of the crown in Battle Creek, the tabernacle itself was burnt to the ground 100 years ago this year. And the Detroit News stated that this burning of the tabernacle was the 13th big fire in Battle Creek's West End and every building saved one that was a part of the Adventist group. There were other buildings owned by Adventists that also burnt to the ground, of which we don't know of at this point unless someone did some meticulous research. God was speaking in judgments by fire because the people were insubordinate and refused to obey the warnings. And brethren and sisters, I speak this in love because that is the nature of human of unregenerate human beings. We are stubborn, stiff-necked, hard-headed hard in wanting our own way. And then ultimately God will leave us to our own delusions. Brethren and sisters, the organizational structure that exists today is not based on Matthew 23, verse 8. It's even admitted by conference officials, Pastor Douglas Devenich, who was then president of the Canadian Union Conference, he said, quote, the Seventh Adventist Church follows a model of organizational order in the church which is modified from the orders of Roman Catholicism. Not even Protestantism, not even apostate Protestantism, but from Roman Catholicism. But it retains the same notions of clerical order which separates the member of the church into classes, clergy and laity. There's your pyramid structure. There's your hierarchical structure, the leadership at the top and the masses of the people at the bottom. Where is the principle? All ye are brethren and one is your master, even Christ. It's not reflected in the current model of the denominational structure. Pastor Raymond of Cottrell, former associate editor of the Adventist Review, made this candid admission. At the local conference level, the Seventh Adventist Church has a representative form of government. Above that level, the polity of the Seventh Adventist Church is hierarchical. Authority flows downward and members in local congregations have virtually no voice. That is the truth of the matter. That's the absolute truth of the matter. The Seventh Adventist Church is a closed, self-operating and self-perpetuating system, notice, similar to the Roman Catholic Church, in which those in authority are not responsible to lower echelons. Above the local conference level, those in authority are not elected by representative of 
or administratively accountable to local congregations or the membership at large. That's taken from Spectrum magazine, March 1984, 38 years ago this month, this statement was published. Brethren, sisters, this is not the model of organization that James White and Ellen White worked for at the very beginning in 1863. And if you think what I'm saying and sharing is out of place, notice the legal decision here made by a judge in the case of Derek Proctor versus the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, case number 81, C4938, issued October the 29th, 1986, Next to the Roman Catholic Church, the Adventist Church is the most centralized of all the major Christian denominations in this country. The General Conference as the worldwide governing body of the Adventist denomination is the church's highest legislative, judicial, and ecclesiastical authority. Brethren and sisters, next to the Roman Catholic Church, the Adventist denomination is the most centralized of all the major Christian churches. And what makes it so? It is that the word of man is placed at the highest pinnacle of authority, not the word of God. This is a legal decision that was made, an admission that was declared in a court of law, and it has never been challenged in all these years since it was made. Do I believe in organization? Absolutely. But it must be under the direction and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Let me read to you here this powerful statement from the General Conference Bulletin 1897, which, which actually describes it in so many words. Organization as carried out in the life as God means it shall be, brings every soul who is engaged in the work of God, his submission to whom? To the divine will, not to the will of man, not to the policy of man, but to the will of God. Wearing the yoke of Christ, that's what it entails. It leads them to give themselves to man? No, to God, to be worked by his Holy Spirit. Now notice these words. Anyone who supposes that it does not mean this organization are no longer to stand in responsible positions, having voice to control in the great closing work for these last days. Is this statement being heeded to, brethren and sisters? Not in the slightest. The previous presentation where we see that over 20.7 US billion dollars has gone into the coffers of the North American division of the denomination within one calendar year through Medicaid and Medicare and the hospital network indicates where the priorities lie as far as this corporation is concerned. It goes where the money trail goes. But that's not God's method of working. So much so, brethren and sisters, that in the very last days, when the final work is to be completed, the whole machinery that man has set up is going to be dispensed with. It will not even be used by God himself. Notice this, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 300. Let me tell you, she says, that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. Just as God could not use the Jewish system at the time of Christ to affect his work of evangelizing the world, but he raised up the early Christian church, just as God could not use the papal system that was baptized in paganism to carry the truth of God, but raised up the Protestant Reformation, God is going to raise up a work in the very last days that will be in, that will have no connection with the system of human organization. Not saying that God will start a new movement. The Advent movement will go to the kingdom. 
But the way in which God will accomplish his work will set aside this vast machinery that man has created, this hierarchy that is modeled after the papacy. God has no use for it. He does not sanction it. He does not endorse it. It will not be used in the finishing of the work. There will be those among us who will always want to control the work of God. That's the problem with man. To dictate even what movements shall be made when the work goes forward under the angel who joins the third angel in the message to be given to the world. God will use ways and means by which it will be seen that he is taking the reins into his own hands. That time is coming so very soon. Maybe we're seeing the beginnings of it already, brothers and sisters, but certainly by the close of probation, the final message will be given and it will be God alone who will have full control over the finishing of the work. He will empower his faithful, obedient little flock with a ladder rain to give forth and lighten the world with its glory, whilst many who profess our faith but have not been sanctified to obedience to the truth will abandon their position and join the ranks of the enemies and become the most bitterest opponents of their former brethren. Great Controversy, page 608. It makes a big difference, brothers and sisters. It is a matter of life and death, whether we wear the yoke of Christ or consent to wear the yoke of man. Notice this statement. This was put in the flyer that was sent out for these Zoom meetings. Those who are wearing a yoke that man has placed on their necks will have to be freed from this yoke before they can act the part that God desires them to act in the proclamation of the truth. Those who receive and believe in Jesus are not to wear any man's yoke. Neither are they to be non-committal in regard to where they stand, neutral, neither this side nor that side. A fierce conflict is raging between two powers, the power of light and the power of darkness. This conflict has a vital interest for the people of God. The question that is asked us is, who will stand on the Lord's side? You cannot remain neutral and yet be Christ's followers, his faithful servants. Brethren, sisters, ultimately we must come down to the choice Will we obey God rather than men? And God is going to have a people that will assert their liberty in Christ Jesus. Review in hell, July 23rd, 1895. Those who know the truth are to be worked by the Holy Spirit and not themselves to try to work the Spirit. See, again, human beings want to even control what God is doing. He won't permit that, brethren and sisters. He won't permit man to spoil and destroy his work. If the cords are drawn much tighter, if the rules are made much finer, if men continue to bind their fellow laborers closer and closer to the commandments of men, many will be stirred by the Spirit of God to break every shackle and assert their liberty in Christ Jesus. Yes, brethren and sisters, God is going to have a people that will vow to wear his yoke, the yoke of Jesus, and no other yoke. God is calling us today to be free from the yoke of sin and guilt, the heaviest yoke that we can bear. God is calling us to be free from the yoke of man-made traditions and regulations which conflict with God's word. God calls us to be free from slavery and bondage and servitude to man and to Satan. John 8.32 says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. My final text here is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 20 to 23. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it, but if thou mayest be free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also he that is called, being free, is what? 
Christ's servant. When we are free, we are the servants of Christ. And when we are the servants of Christ, we are the Lord's free people. We are wearing his yoke. We are under the royal law of liberty. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren and sisters, it means much as to what yoke we shall wear. And by God's grace, I pray that we will choose today and every day to wear the yoke of Jesus. And God will give us wisdom and guidance as to how to navigate through the last days. And with all the different things that will come up, which will challenge our own liberty of conscience, how to relate to those matters. But God will also want us to preserve that freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. He's called us to liberty. Let us not go back to the bondage of man-made religion. Let us bow our heads. Actually, let us kneel if we can as we close this meeting in today's series with a word of prayer. Gracious, kind, heavenly Father, we come upon bended knee this afternoon for those who are able to kneel or with bowed heads, thanking you, Lord, for the sublime message on the yoke of Christ. It is a wonderful message, and it is a very deep message, and it's one that merits further study, dear Father, to understand it in all of its particulars. Father, our hearts are grieved to see, dear Lord, the direction in which things are going in this world, both in the, in, on this earth and also in the church. We know it is foretold that such a time will come to the great apostasy, which is and waxing stronger and will continue to do so until the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. We are living in the omega of apostasy, the very end of this apostasy. The great final crisis is just before us, with the Sunday law question. We know at that time we're told that ministers will urge upon the people in camp meetings and in pulpits of the churches of the land to keep the first day of the week. We're also told, dear Lord, that many will stand in the pulpits of our churches with the torch of false prophecy in their hand, kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. These are very sobering words, dear Father. We must recognize we need an individual walk with Christ. We must have an individual relationship with Jesus. We must stand upon our individual selves, one with you, being a majority, Father, if we take our stand on the Lord's side and to proclaim the truth, dear Father, to the whole world as a witness to all nations. Oh, Father, we not only want to proclaim the truth, we want to live that truth. We want our lives to be an embodiment, a reflection of that truth. And we pray, dear Father, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth shall indeed speak pearls of wisdom coming from the throne of grace. May we always cherish the spirit of Jesus. May we not judge and condemn, but may we assess everything and test to the law and to the testimony and speak forth the words of warning to call sin by its right name. And exhort people to come up higher to the platform that you have established for your people to step upon. That platform of the three angels' messages, which is undergirded by the rock of ages, which will withstand every storm and tempest that comes its way. The truth is triumphant. The message will go forward to glory, into everlasting victory. And those who are sanctified and obedient to that truth will triumph with that message. That's the church that may appear is about to fall, but it does not fall. It is that faithful, obedient souls who will comprise the church of God in the last days. Seventh-day Adventists in name and in practice. And Lord, we know that you have people in other churches who need to be called out of apostate Babylon and come and take their stand on the Lord's side. So be with us as we go forth from this meeting until we meet again in your divine appointment. May we study to know these things for ourselves and prove all things like the noble Bereans. And please give us courage to stand for the right, though the heavens fall. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.